Hello, my friends. Welcome to Be Formed, Season 8, Week 10. This week, we're going to be looking at authentic participation, our inner disposition and how we approach the Mass and how we can fully participate in the Mass. Our presenter today will be Father Brian Geary. He's in, a priest at Holy Family in Shorewood, Illinois. I had the privilege of walking that journey through the seminary with Father Brian, when he was a seminarian, and I was the, his vocation director. Very proud of uh, the young man he is and has become, and the great priest that he is as well. So let's pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for this day. We thank you for the gift of the Mass. Open our hearts to hear all that you have in store for us tonight maybe the areas in our lives where we need conversion. Help us to be able to fully participate and receive all the graces available to us in the Mass. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's prepare our hearts to listen to Father Brian Geary as he talks about authentic participation. Hi everyone, Father Brian Geary from Holy Family in Shoreward here. Great to be here with you today to talk about Pope Benedict and what he has to say to us about the liturgy. Uh, Pope Benedict just had so many wonderful insights about the liturgy and the Mass, and so reading what he has to say about those things I think is always worthwhile. The first part of our selection today talks about active participation at Mass. Active participation is probably one of those, those buzzwords that we've heard thrown around a lot. But maybe we haven't stopped to think about what it actually means and what it actually entails. What, what does it actually even look like? The Second Vatican Council is so very clear that we are all called to full, active, and conscious participation every single time we come to Mass. And so we might ask ourselves, well, what does that look like? Every time we go to Mass, we are doing so many different things. We, we stand, we sit, we kneel, we make the sign of the cross, we open up our hymnals, we sing, we do all of these things uh, in which we are active, in which we are expressing something. But Pope Benedict uh, wants to take us a little deeper into that understanding of participation. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes active participation can be misinterpreted or misunderstood as really meaning that at Mass we just do more things, that the more we are doing at Mass, the more we are actually participating. But Pope Benedict wants to remind us that active participation goes uh, a lot deeper than just those things that we externally do. All that external activity that we do at Mass is really an outward expression of what we are doing interiorly at Mass. Right? We think about one of the, one of the phrases that we say every single time we go to Mass, the priest says, the Lord be with you, and we respond, and with your spirit. And he tells us, lift up your hearts. And we respond, we lift them up to the Lord. We think about the words we're saying, and we ask ourselves, as I'm saying those words, am I actually lifting up my heart to God? Am I actually participating in the offering of the Mass in that way? So Pope Benedict says, what should we be doing at Mass? What should we be doing interiorly that manifests itself exteriorly? And he reminds us we should be giving thanks to God, we should be offering the Immaculate Victim, he says, not only through the hands of the priest, but together with him. That we should learn to make an offering of ourselves. So really, if we want to participate well at Mass, we need to learn how to make of ourselves an offering. Every time we come to Mass, we see gifts of bread and wine offered on the altar, and we know that they become the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. But along with that, we also want to make an offering of ourselves. What am I bringing with me to Mass uh, that I am putting on the altar? What is it in my life? Uh, maybe it's a, a certain person or a situation or just uh, someone who needs prayers in our life that I am offering back to Jesus. That as we make that offering at Mass, that I'm also saying along with the priest, Jesus, I give you everything that I have and everything that I am. Uh, and that's, that's what Pope Benedict means by, by full participation. How do we ourselves participate in that offering? If the Mass is the offering of what Jesus Christ does on the cross, how are we participating in that? We recognize then that when we can do that well, 
when we can do that in an interior level, that expresses itself so naturally on an external level. Pope Benedict also wants to draw the, the clear distinction between uh, our roles at Mass. Uh, as, as, as a body of Christ, we gather together priest and congregation, priest and laity. And the Vatican Council uh, reminds us that we have, we each have our own part to play in that. As a priest, uh, my job is to take the prayers of the people and offer them to God the Father on your behalf. But there's also a lot of parts in the Mass where the, the people are invited to respond that I am not. You, you have so many words to say that I actually don't. And in the, the laity participating in that way, in saying those words and exercising those functions that are proper to them, you properly exercise your own priesthood, your own baptismal priesthood. You are exercising your own ability to make offerings back to God. And so Pope Benedict has this really clear sense that if the, if the beauty of the liturgy is to shine uh, in its full splendor and its full clarity, then it relies on a couple things. That it relies on that active participation, that active participation that is first and foremost interior, but then uh, that participation that is made manifest by each of us exercising our own proper roles. The Pope goes on and he talks about how can we prepare ourselves well to participate actively at Mass. We think about anything, if I'm getting ready for a meeting or a trip or, or what, what have you, uh, we have to put in some prep work, right? I can't make a long trip without making sure I have gas in my car and that I, I know the route, I know where I'm going. Uh, and you can't prepare for a meeting at work if you don't know what you're going to say, if you, if you show up without notes or anything like that. And so if we're to get the most out of Mass, which is the, the greatest thing we can do on this side of heaven, well then it stands to reason that we also have to prepare ourselves well. Pope Benedict talks about a, a couple personal conditions that need to be in place if we're really going to participate in the Mass well. How do we prepare ourselves? And he reminds us that we need to first examine ourselves. What am I bringing into Mass? Where am I in my, my own life? Where am I in my own spiritual journey? Uh, what kind of inner disposition am I fostering? And so he, he gives us a few really clear suggestions that I think we can all take uh, to Mass. And this goes for our priests as well as, as lay people, anyone who is participating in the Mass at any time. He says, by recollection and silence, at least for a few moments before the beginning of the liturgy, by fasting and when necessary by sacramental confession, we can foster that internal disposition. And so maybe, you know, I ask myself, am I getting to Mass a couple minutes early just to spend that quiet time in prayer to bring to mind those things that I want to offer uh, at the Mass? Can I take a few minutes before each and every Mass and just calm myself, remove myself from the busyness and uh, just how crazy the world can be? And am I putting myself in a place where I can learn to hear Jesus' voice? Am I putting myself in a place where I can, I can hear him saying to me what it is he wants me to hand over to him at every single Mass. He also recommends fasting. And fasting is a, is a really powerful practice that we have as Catholics, and not just something that we take up on Fridays during Lent and Ash Wednesday. Uh, but fasting is something that, that we can exercise all the time, uh, certainly to a lesser degree than in those penitential seasons. But there's a reason that the Church asks us to fast from everything except medicine and water, uh, at least an hour before we receive Holy Communion. Right? And when I fast from something, uh, I allow that hunger inside of me to grow a little bit. And as we fast before we receive Communion, what are we doing? But we're allowing that hunger for the Eucharist to grow inside of us as well. So I think there's a renewed call on the part of Pope Benedict for us to take that seriously. How do I, I need to be a little bit more conscious of my, of my fasting before I receive the Eucharist? That when I do receive the Eucharist, it is fruitful and spiritually nourishing for me. And of course, the last thing Pope Benedict mentions in order to prepare ourselves well to receive the Eucharist is sacramental confession. If we're conscious of a grave sin on our hearts, we need to get that cleared up by the mercy of God before we approach the sacrament of the Eucharist. 
In the sacrament of reconciliation, we get to hear those beautiful words of forgiveness. I absolve you from your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And that relationship that is broken by sin is now made whole again. That relationship by which we can approach the Lord worthily and receive the graces that he wants to give us. Right? Sin destroys that disposition inside of us. And so by the sacrament of reconciliation, we put ourselves back in that place of being able to receive the sacrament of the altar again. We also know that sometimes, uh, especially we see this at weddings and funerals, places where a lot of family members and friends might gather with us who are not Catholics. And so what is the church's teaching on communion, the reception of communion for those people who are not Catholics? We might hear at some of those celebrations that communion is reserved only for those who are practicing Catholics. And we might ask ourselves why, if communion is such this, this beautiful gift from God, why is it only that those practicing Catholics who are in a proper disposition to receive it can receive the Eucharist? Well, there's a, a beautiful saying called, the church makes the Eucharist and the Eucharist makes the church. And we remember then that the Eucharist is always connected to the Catholic Church and her teaching. We call the Eucharist communion, not only because it fosters a communion between us and Jesus, but Pope Benedict says it actually presupposes that that communion is already there. And so by approaching the Eucharist and responding, Amen, we are professing that we are in communion with the Catholic Church, and that we are in communion with what Jesus Christ has to teach all of us. And so it's the same principle of why we shouldn't receive communion if we're in a, in a state of grave sin on our soul, because that sin puts us outside of communion with the church. And so those people who are not practicing Catholics, while they are more than welcome to join us in prayer, and they are able to participate as fully as they can in the Eucharistic celebration, that they are not able to participate in the reception of the Eucharist. And so what should be our response to that? Well, our response should never be indifference. If, if the Eucharist is the greatest gift that we have, then we want that to be shared with as many people as possible. And that means we need to work for the unity of the church and the reunion of our separated brothers and sisters back into the fold of the Catholic Church. Look, we all have people in our families, friends, and I'm sure you can name them right off the top of your head, uh, who we want to be part of that fold again, who maybe have fallen away from the practice of their faith. And so the invitation is there for us to invite them back to church, invite them back to Mass, invite them back to the Sacrament of Reconciliation. That that fullness of life that Jesus and the Holy Catholic Church desire for us can be made manifest. So uh, full unity and full participation in the Eucharist is something that we should never take for granted. But it's something we should always work for and especially something that we should pray for. It kind of follows from this. We think about participation in Mass, and uh, we remember that just a couple years ago during COVID, we weren't able to gather, we weren't able to participate Mass in person. And so a lot of us were able to follow along through the great gift that media can be, and we were able to see our parishes and our priests live streamed right for us, and we were able to have that sense of connection with them. But uh, I think for a lot of us, we realized very quickly that just by participating Mass online, it's not the same thing as being there in person. That while participating in Mass online allows us to see and hear the Mass and see and hear our priests and hear those great words that they had to share with us, it's not the same as being there in person. Pope Benedict has a beautiful quote on, in paragraph 57 here. He says, visual images can represent reality, but they do not actually reproduce it. Visual images represent reality, but they do not actually reproduce it. And so while participating in Mass online gave us that sense of connection and it allowed us to participate uh, in a limited way in that sacramental celebration, Pope Benedict reminds us that we can only participate fully in the sacraments when we do so in person, when we are gathered as the body of Christ, and when we are able to unite ourselves to the sacrifice that is being offered on the altar that is right in front of us. He reminds us that the Mass is really a reality that is meant to be lived and experienced and not just simply uh, seen. 
We are not spectators, as Pope Benedict and Vatican II remind us, but we are active participants. And so we might also remember now that there are some, some family members and friends who still haven't come back to church since the pandemic, people who need that personal invitation to come back and rejoin the family of faith, rejoin us at our celebration of the Eucharistic mystery. People who are maybe still participating uh, online, and we remember that, that that doesn't fulfill our Sunday obligation, but only by being there in person, by uniting ourselves with the entire body of Christ and <clears throat> the priest as the head of that body, that we can participate well. Of course, we also know that there are so many in our family and friends who, for some reason or another, actually can't participate with us. Maybe they are sick, maybe they're homebound, and they just have no way of attending Mass. And so in that regard, uh, Masses that are, are broadcast can be a great help for them, <clears throat> that they can participate in the, in the Eucharist in that way. But still we remember then that, that that participation is only limited. And so how do we help those people, those members of our community who are homebound, those members of our community who cannot make it? How do we help uh, bring them even more fully into that Eucharistic celebration? And one, I can tell you one of the, the most beautiful uh, moments of my, my ministry as a priest, some of those most powerful moments are when I go to visit those, those people who are sick and homebound. And I find in those, those men and women so much beautiful faith, <clears throat> a faith and a desire to participate in the Eucharist and a real pain in their heart that they are not able to be there with us. And so every time I give those men and women communion, I can just sense how powerful it is for them that while they cannot be here with us in person, and while they can participate with us sacramentally in that space in their homes, they really feel the presence of Jesus being brought to them. And so while we might not see them every Sunday, and we might not see them at all because they can never leave their houses, we remember that they are still a part of our family and that we need to pray for them. And that we also need to maybe ask ourselves, how am I being asked in my own community uh, to be a light to those people? And so maybe take it to prayer. Maybe there is an opportunity at your own parish to become uh, a minister to the homebound, to, to bring Jesus to those people who, uh, through no fault of their own, are unable to be with us at every single Mass. <clears throat> those people are, are just, just as much as part of our congregations as those people who are there with us every single Sunday. One of the last things Pope Benedict talks about in this part of his document is the Latin language. And Latin can be kind of one of those words that produces so many different reactions in us and maybe by just hearing the word Latin, you're brought back to the, the bad old days where you could really understand what was going on at Mass. And we're so used to Mass in, in the local language nowadays that maybe we, we haven't even heard uh, Latin at Mass in a while. But Pope Benedict reminds us that as Catholics, as Roman Catholics especially, that Latin is a beautiful part of our heritage. We think about ourselves, and so many of us have ancestors who came from all different parts of the world, and we might have a, a certain affection for the language that they spoke before they came here to America. We might have a desire to learn that language. And in the same way, the Latin language unites all of us scattered all across the globe, and the Latin language unites us as one family in faith. I remember one, one moment in my own life. I had the great gift of being in St. Peter's Square on March 19th of 2013, and that was the day that Pope Francis was installed as Pope. And I was in St. Peter's Square with about 200,000 of my closest friends. And aside from the, the few people in my group who didn't get scattered all over the place, there was nobody around me who spoke English. On either side of me, I was hearing about five or six different languages being spoken. Some of them from Europe, some of them from Asia, some of them from Africa. Uh, and I, I couldn't understand a lick of what they were saying. All we could really do is, is just kind of smile and wave at each other. And uh, we knew that we were there for the right reasons and for the same reason. But at the very, the, at the very end of that Mass, everyone in St. Peter's Square broke out in the beautiful hymn Salve Regina. This beautiful hymn to Mary, this beautiful Latin hymn to Mary. And suddenly, in an instant, those people next to me and in front of me and in back of me that I could not understand at all, suddenly we were all singing 
the same language. We were all singing the same words in the same praise of Our Lady. And there was actually a moment where I happened to turn to the guy next to me, and he happened to be uh, turning to me. We just had these big grins on our faces because we suddenly realized that the language barrier that had kept us apart was, was suddenly now broken, and that we were able to worship together as a family of faith. <clears throat> And so maybe Latin is, is not something we're dealing with on a regular basis, and there's a, a lot of great and beautiful reasons to be hearing our own language at Mass, and that certainly helps us participate better. Uh, but we also should try to educate ourselves a little bit on that, maybe learn a few prayers. Um, and then Pope Benedict also says that it's important that we learn how to say some of those, those parts of the Mass and, and kind of reclaim some of our heritage in that way. And so... As we conclude our, our, our little time with, with this, this section of the document, I think we just give thanks to the great vision that Pope Benedict had, this great vision of everyone participating in the sacrifice of the Mass, everyone participating in the Eucharist. Knowing that that participation can take a lot of different forms, at least externally, but interiorly as well. If we want to participate well, we have to prepare ourselves well. We have to prepare ourselves to receive the great graces that Jesus Christ has to give us. And so that's not just a, a task uh, or an ability that we gain overnight, but it's something that we work. It's a muscle that we have to work at every single day. And so we ask ourselves, how am I being asked today to maybe prepare myself a little bit more for, for the Eucharist, to prepare myself a little bit more to receive Jesus and all the graces that he wants to give me? So I thank you for your time, and I, I hope you got as much out of this section as I did reading it. Know that I will be praying for you, and of course, please pray for me and all of our priests out there. God bless you. Thank you, Father Brian, for those great words on authentic participation in the Mass and this ongoing conversion in our lives. Our Lectio Divina this week will be from Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 to 7. I'm not going to read it, but a couple of things that jump out at me is our ability to call God Abba, Father, like Daddy, this intimate relationship with the Father. And St. Paul says to the Galatians that we're no longer slaves, but heirs to the kingdom. Through Jesus, we have become heirs to the kingdom like Jesus. And what God wants, when God the Father wants for Jesus, he wants for us as well, which is eternal life with him forever. Next week, our topic will be interior participa participation in the celebration and adoration and Eucharistic devotion. So I'm excited to talk about that. I'll be the one offering next week's reflection and uh, talk about adoration and the impact that's made in my own life. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for the great priests and bishops that you've placed in our lives. We thank you for Father Brian's uh, dedication to you. We ask you to fill us with your Holy Spirit as we prepare for this weekend and the great celebration of Good Shepherd Sunday. We also pray for an increase in vocations this weekend as we celebrate the World Day of Prayer for Vocations. Help us all to sincerely seek your will and give us the courage to follow you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a blessed week, everyone.